Good morning and welcome to NorCal PTAX webinar with the California Office of Small Business and Disabled Veteran Business Enterprise Services or the California OSDS. Um, this is how to do business with the state of California. My name is James Forrest. I'm the program coordinator and procurement specialist with NorCal PTAC and we're very happy to have Lucy Ann Radinsky, business outreach liaison with California OSDS giving the main part of the presentation today. Um, I'll be handing things over pretty quickly to Lucy Ann. Um, let's skip that one here since I've already talked a bit about housekeeping before we started. Um, and I just want to tell you a little bit about NorCal PTAC and who your hosts are for today's webinar, which if you haven't joined before, uh, welcome first timers. NorCal PTAC is uh, the Northern California Procurement Technical Assistance Center. So as much as we uh, all lament acronyms, I think it's, it's a lot easier to say NorCal PTAC than that whole mouthful. Um, we are a nonprofit center, part of a whole network of centers across the country. There's 96 PTACs nationwide, and that number shifts around. Um, but basically we get funding from the federal and state uh, governments where we're located um, to provide free services to our clients in our area. So those of you who joined today know that this webinar was free. You don't have to uh, get it across any paywall or obligate anything. Um, we want to help small businesses achieve their goals in the government marketplace. Um, in 2021, our clients won more than half a billion, with a B, $500 million in government contracts um, with our assistance. And we're really proud of putting uh, basically what your tax dollars uh, back in your pockets for small businesses. Um, if you have a business that's located in our service area here in green, you can see these 15 counties in northwestern California. Then you are eligible to apply for a one on one services for our actually our actual client services. Um, and with that, what you get is one on one counseling. So you get assigned to a procurement specialist and part of a team of procurement specialists who can share resources and networking and figure out how to solve whatever problem may come up for you. And basically they can meet, they can meet with you over Zoom, a video conferencing, email, text, phone call, whatever works for you and them, and go over all of the processes of selling your goods and services to the government. So Lucianne's gonna talk about how to do business with California. Uh, we can also help you with how to do business with um, your local city government, with the federal government, how to get registrations, how to do market research, how to get certified. It could be really lengthy processes reviewing capability statements, working on compliance, if you actually get a bit, uh, win, a, win a, a contract, and just um, about a few dozen other things related to government contracting. We can also set you up with a custom bid matching profile. Basically what this does is it scours the internet for opportunities that match a list of keywords that you work out with your um, procurement specialists that describe what kind of business you wanna do. So if you wanna build fences, uh, you know, you put in um, fences and, and post hole digging and, and uh, some other things, perhaps in your keywords. And then every morning you wake up with an email uh, with a nice hyperlinked list of bids that theoretically should match uh, what your capabilities as a business are. So that's a pretty neat tool, it's something we pay for and then offer to you for free. There's other services like that that you could pay for, but this is uh, something that we help you manage and, and offer for free. And the other thing we do for our clients is also something we just do for, for everyone who wants to join, which is we put on these trainings. Uh, we find partners we want to partner with, we share resources, um, and we also put on trainings from our own procurement specialists. Uh, we, we, we do a ton of them. We've done about 45 since September or something like that. So um, we're constantly putting on trainings about one a week on average. Um, we want to help you guys out. So uh, these are always free for anyone to join. You don't need to be in our service area to join these uh, trainings. So some of you are from um, different spots, Sacramento, Los Angeles. That's totally fine. It's, this presentation should be relevant for you. All right. Um, you can sign up on our website, norcalptac.org. That's where you get started. Hit up that apply now button. If you're not in this service area, don't stress. There is um, another resource for finding your local PTAC because as I mentioned, there's Dozens and dozens of PTACs, almost 100 PTACs across the country um, at aptac-us slash find a PTAC. All right, so uh, our main presentation today is going to be given by Lucy Ann Radimsky. Um, this is our first time working together and I'm really excited to have um, Lucy Ann's perspective um, also as someone who uh, has run a small business herself in the past. So 
We're really excited for your presentation, Lucianne, and go ahead and take it away. Hi, can everyone hear me? I can hear you just fine. Fantastic. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here to be able to help um, take you along a path of how to do business with California state government. Um, as James mentioned, I actually did work for a small business, a contractor with the state, and I've been working for small business across my career. Um, it's an incredibly exciting time for small business. It's also a very daunting time for small business, and we are well aware of the challenges many of you have faced um, surviving COVID. Um, we want to ensure that you are honored, you are respected, and that you are heard. And through the process I'm gonna go through, we're trying to help simplify so that when you register and then certify your business, um, there are multitudes of resources at your disposal that will help you get to your goal of, of potentially achieving a contract with the state of California. Understandably as well, there's other benefits uh, of certification, which I'll go over. So we'll start with what kind of topics we'll talk about today. So. We want to give you a good sense as to the opportunities in terms of dollars. The state spend over the 2019-20 fiscal year. Um, we'll talk about the requirements of certifications, whether that's uh, small business, small business public works, or DVBE, otherwise known as Disabled Veteran Business Enterprise. Um, the benefits, of course, of being certified. Uh, the Cal e Procure registration and certification process, you know, how we go through that. Uh, keywords, UNSPSC codes, as those are integral to your ability to be seen and also to capture the right solicitations through notifications that you can um, opt into through your profiles. Also, how do we find solicitations? Well, the California State Contracts Register is where you would need to go. The State Contract and Procurement Registration System, otherwise known as skippers, is how you could do some market research, get some intelligence on who's won in the past, what departments are buying what. It's a really important resource for you to get acquainted with and to become comfortable with. We'll talk about advocates, um, the SBDVB registry, and we'll also talk about uh, commercially viable function, commercially useful function, CUF, um, as that is also a very important element of maintaining your uh, good um, graces with the state and also protecting you from any uh, predatory prime consultants who want to use you just for your SB uh, certification. So let's start with the dollars. Now, understandably, the state spends a lot of money. And over the 2019-20 fiscal year, they spent $12 billion. Now, we approximate about $2 billion of that um, was associated with emergency procurements. And emergency procurements tend to be where small businesses fall short of getting in and getting a part of that pie. But we're um, also working towards, you know, changing that um, narrative. And I'll talk to you about the small business emergency registry a little bit later on. As you can see, the DVBEs uh, were able to take about 463 million of that small businesses, 2.8 billion. So understandably, if we take that away from the, the bigger pie, there's an enormous amount of money still viable and still not uh, obtained by small businesses. And again, we're here to help you chip away at that and make sure that you are the most competitive position possible. So for those of you who know about the state and its certifications, this will be no news to you, but for those of you who are just being introduced to state certifications, we only work within the following certifications, small business, small business for the purpose of public works, and the disabled veteran business enterprise. We do not work within minority or disabled business enterprises. Um, those certifications certainly are viable, potentially through federal uh, programs, um, potentially, through city and county, but not through the state of California. So small business eligibility requirements are pretty simple. So you must be independently owned and operated. You cannot be dominant in your field of operation. So there's no monopoly happening. You must have your principal office located in California. And also your 
owners have to be domiciled in California. There are a number of businesses that reach out to California wanting to do business with us, wanting to be considered a small business, but they have actually no footprint in California. So although this may seem like uh, a natural um, expectation, there are still a number of businesses that don't quite understand that you can't do business unless you're registered and then certified as a small business. You also have to be a business with 100 or fewer employees and your gross annual receipts, which are otherwise known as GARS, G-A-R-S, have to be 15 million or less over three years. So <clears throat> if you are a manufacturer, you have to be 100 or fewer employees and a micro business is 5 million or less. And with a manufacturer, there is no GARS cap. So there's no limit to your gross annual receipts. As a small business public works, you need to be uh, together with your affiliates, a business of 200 or fewer employees. Your GARS must be 36 million or less. And again, that's average over the previous three tax years. And again, if you're a manufacturer, it's 200 or fewer employees. And your gross annual receipts again are 36 million or less. And that's a, over the three previous tax years. DVBE eligibility requirements um, are slightly different. Um, to be eligible, you need to be uh, recognized by the VA as having a 10% or more service-connected disability. And so during the certification process, the DVBE certifications tend to take slightly longer because we need to connect with VA to uh, confirm that you indeed have met the requirements um, for the 10% or more service-connected disability. And the disabilities are wide ranging. So if you don't know if you um, meet those qualifications, do reach out to the VA. You probably will be surprised what is within the realm of possibility. You must be 50% owned by one or more disabled ven veterans. And any LLC, limited liability company, must be wholly owned by one or more disabled veteran. So the daily business operations uh, must be managed or controlled by one or more disabled veteran. And the corporate office must be located in the United States. So um, this does not have to be in California, but the disabled veteran must be located in California. So there's a slight variation on DVBE eligibility requirements. Um, I wanted to open up to any questions that y'all might have. Uh, we're gonna piecemeal this so that it's not coming at you so quickly and that we can really you know, keep um, our discussions around the topic at hand. All right, so this is a reminder that uh, if you do have any questions, um, you won't be able to ask them aloud, but you can post them into the Q&A tab in Zoom. Should be, I believe, at the bottom. There's a little Q&A bubble, but I don't see any questions just yet, so maybe let's uh, save them for next round. Great. Okay, as I mentioned, there are tremendous amounts of benefits of certification. So once you certify your company as SBDBBE, your firm is then added to the DGS certified firm database. And so that is the database where buyers go in and search for small businesses and DBBEs. Um, this is the one area that you are gonna be recognized. And that is why keywords and UNSPSC codes are so critical because once they go in and look for you, um, they're doing it with keywords or based on the UNSPSC codes of which their solicitations basically are defined by. One other, prefer or one other benefit is as a small business in a competitive bid, you are able to receive what's called a small business preference. And that gives you 5% um, basically a reduction of your bid. So if you're bidding $100,000 and the next closest bid was 95 or even you know, 98, that bid seemingly is in that the non-certified firm, that bid would potentially have won because it's the lowest bid. But because we have that small business preference, we take 5% from the 98,000 they presented and we reduce it from your 100,000, thus giving you the lower bid. Thus, that small business would have won. And, and I'll show you that a little bit um, further down this slideshow. Um, as I mentioned, 
all competitive solicitations have a small business preference. There are few exceptions, but those exceptions are clearly stated within the solicitation. So there's no confusion as to whether a small business preference will be included. As I mentioned, I gave slightly different numbers, but as you can see, a bidder A who is a non-certified business up against a bidder B who is a small business, they have put in bids within $2,000 of one another. Well, in non-preference terms, bidder A would have won because as best value is defined, it, in this case, it is dollar value. But because bidder B is a certified uh, small business and we're in the state of California, you have a 5% uh, preference. So we remove 5% from the lowest bid and then we reduce that number by the uh, small business bid. Um, thus, bidder B wins the contract uh, at the original amount that they put in the bid for. So it's an incredible you know, opportunity for small businesses to be competitive. The DVBE incentive is another way that um, small businesses can be competitive if they, of course, fall into the DVBE um, requirements. So this is also included in all competitive solicitations that include a DVBE program requirement. So that is something that's baked into the solicitation, whether or not there's a DVBE program requirement involved. And so again, the incentive percentage is up to 5% and it is identified in the solicitation. And what's more exciting is that if the DVEE is also considered a small business, then they can stack those incentives and those preferences. So that 5% as being a small business, plus the up to 5% being a DVBE allows you to get an, an even greater reduction on your bid and making you even more competitive. So again, it's really important to make sure your certifications are up to date and viable. Uh, because there's tremendous amount of benefit if you are bidding um, for having both of those um, certifications in place. This is the SBDVB option. Now, this is a contract vehicle that is available to state departments. And what it allows them to do is not open up to all potential bidders, including just registered as opposed to certified firms, but only to certified firms. So one of the um, ways they can do this is that if it's non-IT or IT goods and services that are between the value is between 5,001 cent and 250,000 minus a penny, um, if those solicitation numbers fall within that realm, then that is an opportunity for them to go directly to two or more small businesses or two or more uh, disabled veteran business enterprises. As I mentioned, that has to be apples to apples, oranges to oranges in terms of comparison of the different certifications. Um, for public works, it is 5,001 penny to 300 and actually 88,000. It was just augmented $50,000 and that's very recent, but it's done every two years. So that unfortunately is a small error I did not catch, but it's 388,000. Um, there's, and as I mentioned, at least two price quotes. So again, either two small businesses or two DVBEs. And so this is a reason why you really want to do your research on skippers, find out what departments have used the SV DVB option in the past, meaning that they have solicitations that fall within the dollar values that determine whether you can use the option and market your company to those state agencies. And particularly those with a first policy. Now a first policy does not mean they automatically use the SVDVB option, but it doesn't mean that a, a department without a first policy cannot use the SVDVB option. And again, if you're looking to do more research, um, and nerding out as to how this came about through code, it's authorized by the government code uh, 14.838.5. Does anyone have any questions? I see a, a little one on the Q&A. So uh, if James, you wanna? That's right, we have a, we have a question about how to get uh, SB certified, like how to actually apply for it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we will go through that. So your first order of business of will be to actually register the business with the state of California through the Cal e-procure 
website. And so that is a portal for everything registration, everything certification, everything search for solicitations, and a myriad of other resources available to you. The certification process is pretty immediate once you've registered your company. Certification uh, takes a number of different documents that you'll need to have ready, including tax documents, your TIM number, which is your tax identification number. Um, and once you're finished certifying, as I mentioned, with just SB certification, it should happen within the next couple of hours after you have um, clicked uh, submit, unless there's some issues with information that you put. Um, otherwise, with DVBE, it takes slightly longer because, again, we have to check with the VA to determine that you are indeed meet the requirements for the 10% disability. But we'll be talking about that just a little bit in terms of certification. Great. And I don't see any more questions for now, so thank you. Great. So, as magically as it would happen, uh, I was mentioning Cali Procure. This is your go-to website for registering your business as well as certifying your business. It is available at www.caleprocure.ca.gov. And it is a really simple website to manipulate and to navigate. Um, as you can see from the start, you can access what solicitations are available through the California State Contracts Register, and you do not need to be logged in to access this. This is a public facing and available to anyone, whether they're registered, certified, or not. So first order of business is, if you want to start the process, you're gonna to need to log in and register. Oops, can you hear? And you'll see below, um, you can start registering your business. You'll have the bidder registration. So this is the first step in registering your company. And you'll see, you know, select the type of TIN, whether or not you're going to use your social security number or your federal employer identification number, uh, the company name, the website. And again, it just leads you through the different processes. So once you're registered, then you can get certified. And we again find ourselves within the Calor Picker website. This time we are actually logged in. You can see on the very top right hand corner, uh, outreach test company. That means I'm logged in and I see the information uh, of my company, but I have no certification record. So see below here it says certification and said, get started and apply for certification just below. And this is just basically an introductory page that helps you understand what information you need to have at the ready to be able to upload into the system. As you can see, the list is at the top, starting with the federal tax returns from the last three years and ending with any specific business structures that you might be required to include uh, and any documentation to support those. So when you're ready and have all that information available, you can get certified by just a click of the button. This is the first stage of the certification process. You can determine what types of certifications you're applying for. And again, if you're a disabled veteran business enterprise and also can fall within small business, be sure to check both those boxes because it can be done together at the same time. If you're a small business or a small business for the purpose of public works, you would check those. The nonprofit veteran service agencies and the nonprofit recognition are not fully certifications. These are just purely, um, just again, a designation of your organization, but does not allow you to access the benefits of a certified firm. We're talking now about keywords and UNSVC codes because within your profile, you are going to need to describe the services or goods that you provide. And what we want you to remember is that it's important to keep your words associated with the market speak. You also need to consider potentially if a brand name associated with those goods might be relevant. So 
really try to think clearly about how you want to present yourself. You can put as many words as you want to, but make sure they really are indicative of what you can do. And there's benefits and income to that because then people can find you because they know exactly what you have to offer. Um, don't necessarily have aspirational goals because then you're going to get requests or um, uh, from state departments. And if you can't actually provide those services, they're going to wonder what's going on with your profile and why isn't it up to date and truly meaningful in terms of, you know, it, it matches your capabilities. The UNSPSC classifications are really important as well because they describe the good or service that you provide. And they are also what is tagged to solicitations. So there's a direct relationship of those UNSPSC codes. And so that comes in handy when you're trying to locate potential solicitations that match your capabilities, as well as it allows you to receive solicitations um, through notifications, through email, and also it allows the buyers to find you because you're matching those UNSPSC codes that are tagged to their solicitations and represent what they're looking for in terms of the supplier. So in the UNSPSC family, there is a family code that ends with uh, four zeros. And then after that, it or even actually three zeros once it passes 100 and then goes on. But let's take, for example, fruits and vegetables. So fruits and vegetables would be uh, one, four, one, zero, zero, zero. And then the apple would be one, four, one, one, uh, zero, zero, one. And so it, it then starts to delineate the specific items within and underneath the bigger uh, umbrella parent uh, code. So you can access the UNSPSC classifications through the link that is posted here on this website, which will allow you to understand all the UNSPSC codes at your disposition. And understandably, it has recently gone a major revamp. I think it was at 80,000 and now we're at 14,000 because we're really trying to simplify the code structure so that doesn't feel overwhelming. Um, in any indication, when you're going through the certification process and you need help, reach out to the Office of Small Business and Disabled Veteran Business Enterprise Services. We are here for you to help you and support you through this process. All the contact information is here at your disposal. As well, we have a business profile update that you can listen in on on Thursday at one o'clock. And my colleague, Wayne Gross, is the uh, lead. So every Thursday at one, all you need to do is send him an email. And his email address is Wayne, W A N W Y A, sorry, W A Y N E D, as in David, gross, G R O S S, at dgs.ca.gov. And I can certainly put that into the chat at the end of our um, presentation. Does anyone have any questions related to anything I might have talked about? Yes, we do. And also I can drop uh, Wayne's email address in the chat right now. So Great. Wait. Um, all right. And we all, Kath Kathleen is also asking for the UNSPSC website. Um, I can do that as well. Just a second. First, let's get to a question. We have a good question here from Safia, who's asking, what's the difference between SB and SB for the purpose of public work certifications? Sure. So SB for the purpose of public works are those uh, companies that deal in construction. So Caltrans uh, would be a very um, important partner for SB of Public Works. So those are only uh, companies that do construction, uh, build out of highways, but very specific to a certain sector. And hopefully that's that's important. Or, and you can be SB and SB Public Works. You don't have to go in as an SB Public Works. You can go in as a small business. Um, SB Public Works is nice to have only because it signifies that you have a construction background. But by all means, you can still um, go after contracts as a small business and, and be in the, the construction sector, particularly those when it comes to um, build out of roads and such. Um, and not have an SVPW. And the nice thing about the SVPW is that 
quite often um, public works companies are larger with more revenue and more employees. And so as you can see, the the requirements, uh, yes. the threshold for going over SB is actually double, approximately doubled for the PW version. Exactly. And I, yeah. I, I was just wanting to mention most of the time, small businesses will then graduate to small business public works because they've exhausted their uh, ability to maintain uh, a small business when they are involved in the, the sector of construction uh, and particularly, in, I guess, build out roads and such. So that's an important point. It's, it's basically, you need to use a, a small business public works because you would no longer be considered a small business. So that's an important point. Thanks. It's a, good problem. Great it's a question. good problem to have, right? It wants you're yes, no yeah. Eligible. And we we hope that we graduate all of you out of the small business certification because the purpose is not to keep you here. It's to give you more opportunities so they can grow in business and you can scale it. One of the benefits, of course, which was not mentioned inherently, is that state is pretty stable. Once you can get, they're basically recession proof. The money will be there because we need to get things done for the good of our society. So it's one of the ways, it's a great balancing act between your, your private sector clients and your public sector clients. So we wish that upon everyone, should the opportunities present themselves to have that good balance, that in the case of a downturn, you've got the public sector clients to kind of hold you through the tough times. It's absolutely true. That's one of the benefits of government contracting in general that we like to discuss. Okay, Laura Bridey is asking, uh, can the public works include design and engineering? It's an excellent question, and I believe it does. Um, I can I can actually, you know what I'll do is I will send the information specifically to all, like as a defined public works, because I believe there is a pretty set uh, standard of the types of companies can apply, but I believe anything related to construction and design would certainly fall into that. Mm -hmm. um, it just needs to be applicable to the project at hand and particularly in case of like, you build out the roads and buildings and such, so. Yeah, my understanding is that A&E is, is pretty, yeah. yeah, should be. Infrastructure should be, needs design to make it stand up. Yeah, <laughs> if you're doing public works with A&E, then, then you're in it. Um, how long is the SB certification valid for? It is generally, I believe, um, for, Gosh, three years, I believe it is. And then it needs to be renewed. It can, does not just automatically renew. You'll be given a um, kind of a alert that you need to renew your certification. All right, great. Thanks, Lucien. That's all we have for now. So this is our favorite bit uh, in terms of accessing active solicitations. Though this, the California State Contracts Register only holds active and live con, you know, solicitations. So those are active solicitations that departments have pulled out um, and they need goods and services. So these are posted on the contracts register and suppliers can access them with being registered or not being registered, but you cannot um, actually apply and, and, and present a bid unless you are registered and or certified um, as it requires those you know, registration and it requires a state uh, number um, to be able to access and present a, a solicitation to the department. Uh, one of the interesting pieces within the CSCR is that you can actually market your services. So a lot of times within the solicitation page, you will see the uh, solicitation information, which is basically the roundup of all the documentation, the uh, documents um, that serve to uh, support the process, giving you exactly what type of information they need, what are the requirements they're looking for, what is the timing. Um, and, you know, and it's really, really explicit because it demands you to be explicit in terms of making sure all that information is a part of the package that you then send in. A secondary portion, you know, that uh, opportunity for you is again, these vendor ads. So you can look at vendor ads. And so primes may be saying, I'm looking for this type of small business that can do this type of uh, service or that can provide this type of product um, because they need you as a partner to make their bid uh, stronger. A, because there's a small business requirement 
or B, they understand, you know, that the benefits of using small businesses, not only for our economy, but to be more competitive in terms of a potential preference. Um, there's also the opportunity to post an ad. So again, you have to be registered or certified to be able to do this, but you can promote your goods or services because even though you can't uh, maybe take on the solicitation as a whole as the prime, you can support a prime contractor in uh, meeting the goals and objectives of the solicitation. And there have been many people that have kind of met, had this kismet relationship because they found each other through these ads. And I, I want to point out the ads actually you used to have to pay for, and now they're free. So that's another like obstacle we've removed from the process. And I wanted to call that out. So as I mentioned, this is the California state government marketplace. Um, and when you get, this is your primary profile page and you would click to start search and you'll be brought to this page. Now event name basically is what the solicitation name is. They use event in, in the place of solicitation. The event ID is a solicitation number and department of course is the department that is um, putting out the solicitation. What's important to know is that within the department, you can't just type in the department name. You need to go to the little hamburger figure right here and you need to search the department and then find its code. It's, uh, I believe it's a three digit code and that will be implemented in there. So it's numerical. You also have the opportunity for an advanced search. And so that allows you to search by, uh, in this addition to, so the start date, now this is the date that the solicitation was made active and kind of placed on CSCR. The end date, this is the date the solicitation will be ending. Um, item description, so these are keywords you can put in there. UNSPSC codes, the service areas that pertain to the solicitation. So if you are a company that can only uh, serve a certain demographic or a certain area of California, this is a great way to know what solicitations are active in your area or contractor license type. Uh, as we mentioned, small business public works, this would probably be an area for you to list the licenses you have, be able to search on those types of licenses and that are required within a solicitation. Um, and various other types of licenses apply to various different sectors. So this is, um, again, a, a great way to look here. So as I mentioned, all three of those areas as well. And then this is the, the solicitation um, kind of landing page, as I was saying. So you've found a solicitation of interest to you and apparently it's remove and construct concrete bridge, concrete slab, bridge, rail, and HMA. And as I had mentioned before, there's a lot of important details that you need to pay attention to. And this being probably the most important, the event end date. There is no sliding on this. If the information of your solicitation, your package is not submitted on this date, and when you see two o'clock PM, before two o'clock PM, um, you will not be allowed to continue in the solicitation and be considered uh, as a potential um, supplier. They are very adamant that this is followed because this is part of the process with state contracts. We need reliable, we need people who read you know, the fine print and we may need to make sure they're actually you know, engaged in the process. And so it's like one, a, a bit of a litmus test. If you can't meet the event end date, there's probably a good chance that you're gonna have a hard time meeting the requirements of the contract. Um, Cause it's pretty straightforward and pretty simple. Um, give yourself enough time. These solicitation packages are nothing to laugh at. Some of them are very uh, robust and require a lot of detail. The contact information. We're always wondering, well, if I have a question, what do I do? Well, this contact information is your first point of contact regarding the solicitation uh, at hand. And the solicitation is, you can see, is put out by the Department of Transportation. So Maxwell Moore is your contact. We highly recommend sending emails. Why? Because you're able to track the emails that you've sent. Um, as well, you can certainly try to reach them um, via phone, but more than likely, they will not be able to answer um, so email is a great way to kind of 
keep track of your communication um, trail with them. Again, I mentioned the view event package. This is the area that will stipulate and it'll give you the number of files listed within this page that shows you all the different requirements and how they want you to present your package. Um, one of the things that we ask you and, 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 and encourage you to do is once you read through the solicitation, uh, really I'm trying to understand and take notes as to all the different pieces that are expected of you in order to be able to present a complete package, otherwise known as a checklist. Um, and sometimes the solicitations actually have those checklists um, included so that it alleviates a lot of the burden on you to figure out, well, what exactly do I have to turn in? But reading that solicitation in a very quiet place and really being concentrated is a first good step. <clears throat> the post vendor ads. That's another area, again, as I had mentioned, where you can actually pr uh, promote and market your um, abilities in terms in your, your offering uh, to others that are going to be looking through this solicitation. And um, by all means, if there's some questions and answers uh, that I can provide, I would be happy to. All right, we've got some excellent questions here. Um, just a reminder for folks to put that, it's a little easier to follow along if you put it in the Q&A um, tab. So Safi is asking, um, how, how does CSCR differ from Cal eProcure or are they the same? Uh, Cal eProcure is the, the page and the CSCR is basically a portal within Cal eProcure. So think of Cal eProcure kind of like the mothership and CSCR is one of the entities you can access through Cali Procure. So that's dedicated to active solicitations, whereas Cali Procure is the overarching body between certifications, registration, training, um, advocate lists. So it's it's basically the building and CSCR is one of the floors. Great, I, I like the metaphor a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to have Cali Procure. Cali Procure is a really good one-stop shop. That's uh, really nice to have in government contracting when there can be so many different resources uh, all over the place so makes it easy um john pimentel is asking uh, do any city or county government procurement offices use the same systems so cscr or cali procure yeah um they do this is only for state solicitations now uh you bring up an interesting uh comment though because one of the benefits of certification and certifying with the state is that You've done one certification that now is going to be recognized by cities and counties, but that handle their own uh, procurement and solicitation process via their own websites. So even though there's no city or county solicitations listed to Cal Procure, there is, however, a wonderful benefit of being certified with the state because those that um, certification is recognized by cities and counties and understandably not all so i'm going to put a caveat we have a list of what's called reciprocity partners and those partners are those that have said yes we will accept and recognize a state certification and we are working diligently to make sure that all cities and counties fall into that list currently we're about i think in the 58 range but that also includes the university of california so there's a myriad of ways that your certification can apply. It's almost like your calling card outside of the state, designating you as a small business of the state of California. Great. All right. Thank you for that answer. Uh, Blaine has a good question here in the ad section. Can you post to be a sub? In other words, if you can't complete all the work, but you can do 50%. Is that where you would place that info? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this when we're saying post vendor ads, it's your opportunity to present yourself as a potential partner. Um, I mentioned before that, yes, yeah, sometimes these solicitations are far too large, but there's a, a, an ideal space for you to fill a, an important requirement. And by all means, we highly, highly advise you to present yourselves as a, a potential small business partner or business partner uh, if you are registered or, and then even better if you're certified, because understandably small businesses are an exceptional partner to primes because it allows them to have a stronger solicitation and be more competitive. Okay, 
Um, great, we're gonna do some market research in a second, but um, uh, John has another question here. Uh, can a bidder know how many other bidders are in the bidding process? So if there's three, it might be a lot more appealing than if there's 200. Excellent question. I would like to say that it is up to the departments to disclose that information. I think sometimes the information can be highly sensitive. Uh, other times they are very open with information. So it's not across the board. Uh, it's really case by case, depending on the competitiveness of the uh, solicitation in case of the, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the level of visibility of the solicitation. Um, so it's one of those things you can certainly ask the question. Uh, you may or may not get an answer. I know that's probably a non-answer, but, and again, it's really case by case. And so, but I highly advise you to ask the hard questions. That's the, that's. That's your role in trying to better understand where do you want to put your time and effort. And that's why doing that due diligence, really understanding how departments buy will save you a lot of time and headache in trying to knock on doors that actually don't need your goods and services. Mm -hmm. So instead of the kind of uh, mass emails, do a little bit of the research. Show these departments when you're emailing them that you actually know what they need. And that you're seeing that there's a uh, a frequency or a pattern that's developed in terms of um, a good or a service that you can provide, and you see that a contract is about to come up uh, for potential rebidding. So these are the types of things that are going to make you look really good in front of state buyers. And you can imagine how many people are trying to get their attention. Be smart. Show them that you've done your due diligence, and I, I can assure you. They will probably be far more eager to respond, knowing that you've taken the time. That's absolutely true. And it, it, from the PTAC side, we're, we're helping out small businesses all the time. And I can tell you, uh, most of our time is spent helping them with, with market research. And you can tell which businesses are going to be successful, gauged on how seriously they take that task, of um, how motivated they are to find the right person to talk to. Um, and just another note, you won't know how many bidders on, on a current bid of solicitation are actually going to bid on it until after the close date. Um, so that's a good opportunity to do some past market research, which I think is what we're up for next, right? True, true, true. All right. Are we good? Fantastic. Yeah, keep rolling. So, so this is our gem of a market research tool called the State Contract and Procurement Registration System, otherwise known again as Skippers. So this is a portal that allows you to access all past solicitations. Um, it dates back pretty far. So one of the best practices that I would uh, advise that you do is that you have a certain date uh, timeline in place. You know, three to four years is one thing, but if you're searching this entire system, you may be waiting till tomorrow to get any sort of feedback in terms of the system being out to put out information. Because the more um, time you're having them look, the amount of time they have to scour each of the different pieces of documentation, uh, you're not going to get any sort of answer. Um, so being as specific and keeping that timeline you know, as close as possible um, in terms of like, we're in 2022, I wouldn't probably go past, you know, 2015, um, particularly in, in terms, you know, understand it'll be 2020 uh, to, to about now is a little skewed because of COVID, but then we've also had fires that have, you know, in terms of emergency procurements. So again, just be smart about how you're searching the system. Uh, and again, what this system will provide you is you will get to see the different departments, the different solicitations they've put out, the different contract vehicles they've used. So in, in one instance, we've talked about the SB option. Um, you can see the actual bid that won. And you can see the types of pricing that actually was successful. And so that is a way to understand, are your pricing, is your pricing competitive? Um, in some instances, like a what's called a leverage procurement agreement called LPA, there are defined prices based on a GSA schedule. And so that's probably talking a lot of, you know, state talk, but basically there's established prices um, already that uh, pre-qualified vendors 
have accepted. So that's not something we need to talk about now, but just to let you know, when you're looking through the system, you need to understand the context of the state or of the contract vehicle as well. And again, we can help you understand those different contract vehicles. Um, when you're searching and you want to know what a, an MSA is versus a CMAS, we're here to help you. So again, we're back at Caliper Cure. We're on our main page. And we are going to find the public procurement information skippers um, through this little uh, rectangle here called Find Public Procurement Information. Um, you've come to the page and you'll see here the second bullet under search for is past purchases in the state contracting procurement registration system. You can also find it in quick links, just to let you know. So we're gonna, you know, this is gonna be another way you can access this information. When you click on skippers, this is the page you're gonna be showing. So it's already gotten some, uh, you know, the list below, but as you're implementing or inputting a uh, department name or description or acquisition type or the transaction start and end date, um, the, that list will start to uh, change and um, have the results that match the criteria that you have set. We also have advanced search criteria because you can search uh, via other types of um, key elements as well. And again, I highly recommend going and navigating the Skipper system. And it's a pretty straightforward system and offers you a ton of information. Uh, if the results become uh, a little bit too difficult to understand, we're here again to help you. We can walk through the different um, line items with you and help you understand which pieces you really need to pay attention to, um, and we're happy to do so. Okay, great. And we do have some questions here. Uh, first one is, yes, uh, Skippers is consolidated in the Cal Eprocure website. Met, um, one of those screenshots showed that. Um, and then Safi is also asking, um, is there a website where California ages, agencies post their look ahead annual procurement plan? There are some departments that have upcoming solicitations posted on their websites. Not all departments do. DGS does. Um, and we actually are trying to work with advocates to ensure that their departments have that information so that uh, small businesses and registered businesses, for that matter, can start to prepare. That being said, Skippers is a great way to identify potential upcoming solicitations because you're seeing uh, contracts that have been re uh, awarded over a certain amount of years. Um, so you can gain a lot of market insight by looking at departments and their solicitations across you know, a 10 year scope or so. Some contracts understandably are quite long. A lot of the IT, um, uh, when you're trying to navigate from an on-prem to a cloud, those projects can last for years. And so there's, you know, uh, differentiations that you should keep in, in, in mind, but for the most part, you can get a sense that there's a consistency among certain um, solicitations that might be coming up for a rebid in the future based on past data coming from skippers. All right, great. Uh, let's keep things moving along. Just to note that we, um, it looks like we are going to go long. Um, so I'll post a link in the chat. If you have to get out of here, just let us know uh, what you thought of today's webinar. Uh, but if you can stick around, then then please do for this last bit of the presentation. So an important resource for you as well are SBDVB advocates. There is a, a mandate to have one per department. Sometimes there is an opening uh, because of a change of staff. But for the most part, you can access advocates. Um, they are your first point of contact uh, on an everyday basis to understand the needs of a department. And they're serving as a resource to you. Um, and I would definitely contact an advocate if a solicitation is not in the works that you're interested in, there's no you know, department contact listed in the solicitation. I would get to know your SBDVB advocate based on your research, knowing that that department needs your goods and services. And you can access the list through Cal or Procure. And sure enough, I'm gonna show you how. So, the area just below 
additional resources. And then you go into research and marketing and it says contact a small business and DVB advocate. This is the page that gives you kind of a background as to who, what the, the purpose of an advocate is, as well as the SBDVB advocate directory listed below, uh, uh, sorry, on the top. Um, you click on that, it leads you to this page. The departments highlighted in yellow have an SB first policy that basically is a formal policy that stipulates that their procurement staff is intended to approach every solicitation through the eyes of a small business and see how they can incorporate small business from the onset. So that's, you know, SB friendly. But honestly, each department has an expectation to meet the 25% SB and 3% DVB goals. So every department uh, is small business friendly because they need to meet those goals. Again, you're wondering about the Small Business Public Works. This is a column that would be an incredible asset for you to look at um, because as you can see, the High Speed Rail Authority, you have the Prison Industry Authority. So SBPW would really fall into this category and within these departments. This is an exciting new uh, development. We have stood up for the first time a dedicated emergency registry that only has small business and DVB companies listed in it. As I've mentioned before, emergency procurements are one of the areas that we're trying to beef up small business and DVBE participation. We want state departments to reach out to small businesses and DVBs during an emergency situation. So we set up this registry to allow for buyers to quickly access small businesses that have stated they are ready and able and willing to support um, them in an emergency situation. State departments have access to this. It's only at state for the moment. I don't believe we'll be opening up to cities or counties or any of our other partners, but it is a great way to make sure that you are top of mind and easily accessible and found during the uh, time of an emergency. And we see that buyers are using it outside of an emergency situation. So again, there is a list of categories that are um, uh, defined, uh, but we've, le we've left room for um, other uh, sectors that may not be explicit and in terms of miscellaneous services and miscellaneous goods. So what types of companies are we looking for in the emergency registry? Well, you need to be a small business or DVB certified with the state, and you need to be able to meet the goals and objectives and the needs in terms of stock, in, in terms of urgency of the departments during a state of emergency or in terms of a, a crisis situation. This is not an aspirational goal. We are not asking uh, if you want to be eventually emergency uh, ready, we need you to be emergency ready yesterday. So that's a really critical point. Even though we cannot filter your organization, it is an exercise of trust. We are trusting that the companies that are registering their businesses within this emergency registry are capable of meeting the demands in an emergency, situa emergency situation. So again, the quality of the registry is critical for gaining trust of the buyer. If we can maintain the trust of the buyer, they're going to want to use this. And already to date, since the launch in September, we've seen over a million dollars in top contracts coming to small businesses through this emergency registry. So it's working, and we're really excited about it. As I mentioned, the emergency registry categories, these are a couple of them. Our latest emergency registry that we added was construction, because we felt it, does, it in the end, uh, demanded its own category because of the uh, sensitivity to specific elements related to construction that didn't necessarily fit into the other um, categories. And again, we're always here, we're always listening. And so if buyers are looking for more information um, and they can't really find it in the categories, they want an additional category to be developed, we're going to add it in. So this is a live project. It's constantly evolving and constantly improving because we wanted to make it the best it can be. So if you're ready and you're willing and you've got what it takes,
this is what you're going to need to register your certification number. You need to determine what emergency categories you fit in. You're going to need to describe your goods and services. And again, being explicit and, and, and providing relevant terms that state buyers will understand is really critical. Your business address and your contact information, which includes both you know, day and night, because it needs to be around the clock service because emergency doesn't have a time. It happens at all time of the day. There are also step-by-step -step instructions and access to the registry through this link I provided here. And we also have a dedicated email that any questions related to emergency registry, we have a number of staff members manning that email and you will get a response in a very quick turnaround. This is one of the, again, last things I'll be talking about today, the commercial useful function. This is critical and here's why, because it is important that when you are promoting your business, that you are actually promoting your business in its you know, capabilities, not as something you want to do, but something you do do. Um, it's really important that you're not presenting yourself as a certain type of company and not able to perform the function. So all, as it states here, all California certified SBs and DBBEs bidding or participating in state contract regardless of procurement approach or payment method used, must perform CUF. How is that defined? Well, when you perform CUF, you mean, it means that you're executing a distinct element of the work of the contract. So there is a specialized component of it and you're actually executing it. You are actually performing, managing, and supervising that work. You are not subcontracting uh, a portion of the work that is greater than would be expected in an industry. Uh, normal practices. You are negotiating price, determining quality, quantity, ordering, installing, and making payment. And you're performing work that is normal for your firm's business services and functions. So if you're a cleaning company and you all of a sudden decide to go into construction, you're most likely not performing CUF. Um, certainly, oops. you're not performing CUF, again, this is as important as an extra participant in a transaction, contract, or project, through which funds are passed in order to obtain the appearance of an SBDVB participation. And this is what I was mentioning be before. It is critical that you do not come under the influence of a prime contractor that wants to use you as a small business, but not actually use you in terms of your capabilities. That is critical. Do not get yourself in a situation like that because both of you will be held accountable for having gone into that partnership. So protect yourself. If you have questions, reach out to our business, reach out to our business outreach services group, and we will help you navigate. Um, again, you're not being used to perform the work. And um, it, it's something that actually can be really detrimental because you may be um, removed from any potential participation in future state contracts for a certain number of years or have a fine and or a financial liability, which could be significant and could you bring your business down. So a quick review over what we talked about. We know how much money's out there. The pool is you know, 12 billion as of 2019-20. There's enough for everyone to get a piece of that pie. The requirements are fairly easy to understand. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of benefits. Uh, we've introduced you to Cal eProcure, and this is your go-to portal for registering, certifying, and navigating everything that's solicitation driven, uh, and to find access to resources as well. Uh, we've mentioned the different uh, portals, the CSCR, the skippers, uh, which allow you to do that research that you need to be um, ready to uh, bid on a solicitation and ready to also understand who needs your goods and services. We talked about the advocates that are, you know, again, at your service and ready to help you understand what might be upcoming in the state. Uh, department that they work in, what types of goods and services uh, that they purchase. Although again, you can find that information in Skippers, the emergency registry that was put into place to help you. Um, so, and again, CUF. So it was a lot of information, but I'm hoping that it was done in such a way that you've come away knowing that your first step is, if you haven't already, get yourself registered and certified with the state of California. These are the resources. Uh, of there are many, uh, PTACs being an essential resource for those companies who are, you know, a little further down the process. Uh, 
Uh, the SCORE group is great for those entities that are a little smaller. Um, and you've got the business development centers, the veterans and business network. So these are just a, just a snapshot of some other resources available to you. Um, also, we'd love to have you follow us on LinkedIn because you're gonna get updates on events, on potential solicitations um, that might be of interest to you. So please, if you don't do but one thing today, go to LinkedIn and connect and follow us with the Office of Small Business and DVB services. And then we also provide a Microsoft one-on-one -on -one appointments. So this QR code will allow you to access our Microsoft booking and you can connect with myself or one of my, of my colleagues. You won't necessarily have a choice necessarily um, of who you meet with, but all of us are competent and all of us are you know, ready and willing to help you. This is my information and by all means, if you want to contact me directly, I would be happy to talk with you. Um, it is my great pleasure to help support small businesses, and I want to see you be successful. All right. Thank you so much, Lucianne. Um, I really appreciate all the work you put into putting this presentation together and sharing with everyone. Um, and uh, so just a reminder, everyone's going to get the slides as well as a video recording. Um, I'll also uh, take special care to provide everyone with Lucienne's contact information that you saw on that slide, uh, but you'll be able to download these later and peruse them at your leisure. I just want to just briefly indicate that NorCal PTAC has a couple um, of upcoming events. Most notably, um, if you join this webinar and you felt that um, it didn't get into enough of what happens after you're certified and looking for contracts, um, then it, on Thursday is a great opportunity um, to get some of that information. Um, some of it will be, as I understand, some of it would be a little bit redundant from what was said today, but that we will, it will expand into what you should do um, to actually get your uh, head in the game after you're certified. So that's also with Lucienne uh, this Thursday at 10. And we've got a, a, a general moving forward into June. June 9th, we have a introduction to government contract, the, the how to do business with the government, same thing, uh, webinar. It's part of a series of webinars we're doing um, every month, and then we've got a webinar on HubZone, which is a federal certification uh, based on your geography, the location of your business. So please check those out on our website. They're always free to join for everyone. Um, I don't see any questions, and we're a little bit over time, so I'll go ahead and just thank everyone so much. Um, in the chat, I am putting, and I have actually already put a link to uh, some uh, survey evaluations. If you just want to let us know what you thought of today's webinar, you can do it anonymously. Um, we always want to improve our services to, to do the best we can for all the small businesses and disabled veteran businesses out there. So um, thanks everyone again for joining and um, I'll see you at future webinars. Bye everyone. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.